Welcome everyone to class tonight. We are honored and pleased to have Professor John Landy with us from the University of Missouri. And John, I want to start out by just having you talk a little bit about your background and how you got to negotiation and how you got from negotiation to this whole risk analysis in litigation and um, how all that ties together. Sure. And I'll try not to take the full hour with this uh, background on the by the way, I should also say, first, a couple of things. One, I appreciate the invitation. Um, I am a retired law professor. Um, I enjoyed teaching. I did not enjoy grading, um, but I really um, enjoyed the interaction. So I really welcome um, your and, and encourage and invite you to participate in the conversation. Uh, also, one of the things I would tell you is what I told my students they were welcome to call me John, Mr. Landy, Dr. Landy, Professor Landy, or oh great one, master of the universe, whichever they're most comfortable with. Uh, I'm very comfortable with John, but uh, and of course, sounds like you're mostly gonna interact with me by chat, but um, anyway. So a little bit about my background. Um, I graduated from law school in 1980, um, practiced law for a couple of years, hated it, uh, very adversarial, just not my style. Um, learned about mediation in 1982, went to a CLE program. That was much more who I was. And so I uh, took more training and set up my own practice doing law and mediation in the San Francisco Bay Area where I lived. And then I had always been interested in an academic career and I went and got a PhD in sociology at the University of Wisconsin where I studied uh, sociology of law and particularly dispute resolution. Uh, and then I took several teaching jobs uh, and I've been at the University of Missouri since 2000 and are retired from teaching in 2015. Although uh, everyone teases me that I'm the busiest uh, retired person they know because I continue to write and blog and, and do all sorts of things like uh, have these conversations with classes like yours. Um, so, I have been interested in dispute resolution for my whole career, um, starting with the mediation. And um, gosh, you know, in early 2000s, I learned about a collaborative law, which some of you may be familiar with. It's a process where uh, parties and lawyers sign an agreement to reach an, uh, to negotiate from the outset of a matter. And it's used almost exclusively in family law. And the distinctive feature about collaborative law is that there's a written participation agreement where the parties and the lawyers make a binding commitment that they will um, not litigate and they will not even threaten to litigate. And if they do, then the, the collaborative lawyers are disqualified. And if the parties want to hire lawyers, they have to hire new ones. And I was intrigued by this idea of negotiating from the outset um, and I spent a number of years writing about collaborative law, and I have some mixed feelings about it. In a lot of ways, it's very good. They're very much oriented to um, what's called um, interest-based negotiation or, or just uh, integrative negotiation. Uh, I don't know if you've covered that already, Jim. Um, yeah, not. Okay. So, you know, there are two fundamental models in traditional negotiation theory, an adversarial one where each side is trying to get the most they can, and a more cooperative one where the goal is to try and, and produce a, an agreement that is in the interest of both sides. And collaborative lawyers were interested in this latter approach. And um, so I was interested in that um, and wanted to broaden it because this disqualification agreement was very limiting and it doesn't allow I mean, it's used only in family law, just about. And so I, I broadened it so that I eventually wrote a book called Lawyering with Planned Early Negotiation with the idea of having lawyers start with negotiation, but not necessarily with um, an agreement with the other side and not with a disqualification agreement. So I was very interested in early negotiation because one of the problems, and this will be relevant for any of you who are going to be doing litigation, is the way a lot of litigation happens in negotiation litigation. People start off, the lawyers file a lawsuit and then they do discovery. And sometimes they will negotiate even before a lawsuit, sometimes soon afterwards. But often what happens is they think, well, I'm not going to negotiate until I've done all the discovery because I don't have all the information. And so 
what happens is they don't do negotiation or mediation until late in the process. And by that point, people have already invested a lot of time and money. It's very stressful. Uh, there is some cost bias where they feel like I've, I've gone all this far. And um, so I, I really need to keep on going because I've invested so much. And so this late negotiation, this late mediation seemed counterproductive to me. And so that's really how I got interested in um, this early negotiation part. And then the story about how I came to write this book that we're going to talk about was uh, I was on the publication board of the ABA section of dispute resolution. And they asked us to see if we could identify potential authors. And I suggested my, to my co-authors uh, who turned out to be my co-authors, uh, I asked them if they'd be interested in writing a book. And because uh, they have done a lot of work on litigation risk assessment. And they said, yeah, we'd like to do it and we'd like you to co-author it. And so that is the medium length story about how I got here. All right. So we have sent you uh, a few questions. Brandon, Brandon sent a few and I sent a few. And um, I want to start by sort of giving you the opportunity to talk about your connection between uh, the, the litigation risk assessment model and the BATN and how those two relate together. Sure. Um, one of the things that I will do by way of background, and I'll get to the question very shortly, is that, um, you know, I, this is, I'm retired. This has been my whole career and I've accepted traditional negotiation and dispute resolution theory. And as I've gotten old and been working on things, I've been finding things that haven't worked and that have been problematic. One of which is BATNA, um, which I gather you've talked about in class or, um, yes. so, um, if you read any text, if you Google, you'll find a ton of references to BATNA. And it's sort of discussed in a very offhand way. Well, find your BATNA. Once you know your BATNA, then that'll help you negotiate. Well, it is really a lot harder to do for a lot of reasons. And what, and, and people are confused about what BATNA is. And I was confused. And I think you, you read one blog post that may have linked to another one that illustrated, or actually about how I was confused um, which is very common for many of experts in the field. There are two different ways of thinking about BATNA. One is a course of action. The other is the value of that course of action. And so if you are in litigation, the correct way to think about BATNA is the course of action, which typically, well, is to go to trial. Uh, although there are lots of other potential alternative courses of action. You could unleash a Twitter mob on the opposing, opposing party. You could do some self-help. There are lots of different things you could do to try and get the outcome that you're looking for. So it's the course of action going, um, continuing litigation going to trial. And then what you wanna do is figure out what the value would be, which is a very tricky thing to do because litigation and trial are very uncertain. So what you wanna do is figure out the BATNA value and we can talk about how you go about doing that and how that relates to the litigation risk assessment is what you really want to know as a practicing lawyer is the, the BATNA, what you expect would happen if you went to court is an important piece, but you really want to know the bottom line. What is the minimum that your client would accept? So for, if you're a plaintiff or the most that you would pay. So, uh, and how does that relate to BATNA? Well, there are two other elements of this calculation in order to come up with a bottom line. One is the expected value, uh, so uh, one is the expected future tangible costs and the other is the expected intangible costs. So let me give an example. Suppose that Jim is my client, he's a plaintiff, and um, we, I do my analysis, I do my legal research, I do the discovery, and my best estimate is that he would get $100,000 if we went to trial. Now, to do that, it would cost $10,000 in my legal fees and in expert witness fees and other litigation costs. So if you deduct that $10,000, he would be much better off to accept anything more than $90,000 in settlement now rather than going to trial. Now, there are also these intangible costs in the future. Jim is a very nervous guy. 
he does not like um, the prospect of going to trial, being cross-examined by the, the defense counsel, the uncertainty of what's going to happen. It's taking time away from his, his life and his career. There's all sorts of stuff he really doesn't like about this. And so um, he decides that it's worth $20,000. He's willing to take $20,000 less to get this thing settled and get it out of his life now. So what that means is if you deduct the $10,000 of future legal expenses and the $20,000 of these intangible costs in the future, that would give him a bottom line of $70,000. In other words, if he got a, a settlement offer today of $70,000 or more, he would do as well in his own way of thinking as if he went to trial and got a verdict of $100,000. He'll be right with you. My window is open and it's making a lot of noise out there. Okay, so hopefully did um, that address your question? Yes, yes. Brandon, do we have questions yet from the students? Um, we started to, but they were talking more about the reality testing article. So if we wanted to switch that direction, I can certainly ask that question. Um, the first question was, in the reality testing article, a question that was recommended to ask the client is, if this case goes on for a year, do you think it would affect the way people think about you? Um, do you think asking this question might cause clients to start to worry about how people will view them when they initially may not have been worried about that? Um, you know, do you think that the question is okay to ask? Uh, they don't, without, you know, how can you do that without offending your client, essentially, or really, creating a stress? Really I'm sorry for interrupting. That's a really excellent question. And part of what that reflects is that actually working with clients generally and asking sensitive questions like that requires a lot of good people skills, good interpersonal skills, good sensitivity, paying attention to what your clients um, are feeling and wanting. And one of the things I will tell you from the work that I've done throughout my career is that law school pretends that lawyer-client relationships are trivial, that they are no, no big deal. You know, lawyers and clients are on the same wavelength and you can simply get quite, you know, information you need from clients. I mean, if you look at appellate case reports, you know, the clients are like invisible bystanders. They hardly exist. In real life, when you're representing clients, they are the center of your life. And they have strong feelings as implied by the question. And part of what this means is that from the very outset of a representation, you need to be developing a good rapport with your client and getting a feel for what they're comfortable with. So to address the specific question that you asked, or the student asked, by the time you get to that point, hopefully you already have a good feel for what the client is feeling and wanting, and you're able to ask that question and one, decide whether that's an appropriate question to ask, and two, um, to ask it in a sensitive way. Now, one general way to ask uh, sensitive questions like this is to normalize it. So you can simply say, you know, a lot of people um, in a situation like this feel concerned that um, other people are going to um, you know, think, you know, poorly about them. I didn't phrase that one well, but they're, they're going to, um, it's going to raise questions in people's mind about that. Um, I don't know, is that something that you're concerned about? So you're not putting it exactly on them. You're raising it as saying, well, it's a common thing and um, you can um, see what they feel. So a, a lot of it has to do going back to developing a rapport and the good listening skills, which hopefully you've learned or will learn uh, in this course and or others, which again, you'll hear me on my soapbox complaining about legal education and all the things that are so important that you probably don't learn. Um, so anyway, let me stop there. Sure, and to stay on that, um, that topic, uh, another question from a student, uh, Monica, asked, your model reality testing questions appear to me to be trauma-informed. Is that correct? What special training do you recommend to lawyers to assist them in interviewing clients who have been victimized in order to prevent more trauma? Wow, great question, Monica. Um, and actually, one of the, the appendices in our book is particularly oriented to 
clients in family law matters where uh, quite a number of parties, particularly women, have been traumatized. Um, and I mean, one of the things is if you're in, if you practice a lot of family law, that's something that you really do need to get training for. Although um, one of the things that I've learned having practiced some family law and learned some about it is that uh, and about domestic violence is that it's not limited to family law cases. So for example, if you do employment cases or you do landlord tenant, there can be sexual harassment in lots of different contexts. And of course, it's not limited to women. It's not limited to same sex uh, situations. So in part, again, it's first in the instance, the first instance is developing good listening skills, paying attention, particularly to nonverbal cues and also um, developing a sensitivity to those, um, those potential problems. Um, and part of this is just being a, a good, sensitive human being. Uh, I'll tell you a story. When I first uh, got my mediation training, I went to a training and um, I was role playing a mediator. And uh, one of the parties was obviously very agitated and I turned to the person and I said, well, you seem pretty upset. And one of the people in the training who apparently was a therapist said, you can't do that. That's therapy. Well, no, that's not therapy. This is being a human being. It's being a, a good, sensitive human being. And part of what it's about is, is being aware of what's going on with your client and trying to be sensitive and caring. And you know what, if you convey to your clients that you are interested in them and you care about them, they will forgive you all sorts of things. And, and if you act as if they're just another case, they're just another number, then you can be as smart and informed as you want and that will piss them off and you won't get a good result. So a, a lot of it, I would say, one is the training and two is is a kind of general personal sensitivity. I think that also somewhat addresses some of the other questions that we had about uh, kind of from the lawyer's perspective with some of these sensitive questions. How do you, uh, how do you approach, how do you use an approach that will not, you know, basically make them run and go find another lawyer because they're such sensitive topics or these, maybe they haven't thought about some of these questions. Maybe it's something that they, the client feels pushed on. So as the lawyer, how do you keep them from, you know, running to the next guy who's not going to ask them such sensitive questions? Sure. Well, for one thing, I would say the questions in that post that I'm thrilled that you read them, and I'm also thrilled that you're asking all these questions. That's terrific. Um, you have to understand them in the, the context and the sequence. These are questions that you would be asking later in the process. Um, first, you're going to want to find out the facts of the case. Um, typically, you're going to want to be very supportive and understanding. Doesn't mean you're necessarily going to be agreeing with them. So if they say, you know, Jim was the guy on the other side and he did X, Y, and Z, you're not necessarily going to assume that in fact he did those things, but you can say, well, gosh, I understand how you feel. It's really upsetting when someone does this um, and, and being empathetic and supportive and again, if you convey that you're there for them and you care about them, that will, um, and that you're going to do your best for them, that's going to go a long way. And this, clients differ. Some want pit bulls who are just going to fight and do everything, and they really don't, you know, they, they don't care about a lot of this. They just want someone who's going to be a tough SOB who's going to get the most they can for them. Um, Others are really, they, they, they care what their lawyers think about them. And so giving them that reassurance, and, and that's something that when you're in practice, you're going to have, and particularly if you're in private practice, you're going to have a sense of, um, and, and you know, if you're thinking about the initial client interview, um, lawyers tend to be very positive and supportive and, and affirming um, one of the causes of bias and overconfidence and errors um, is 
because there's over there's a what we call a conspiracy of optimism where you're actually too encouraging uh, the clients think that you're telling them they've got a great case where you're not necessarily saying that you don't know that at the first instance but you're trying to be encouraging um, both pers interpersonally and also for lawyers who um, are in private practice you want to keep them as a client um, I hate to say this but once you have them as a client it's really hard to switch um, clients are very reluctant to switch lawyers um, lawyers are very reluctant to take clients who've been represented by other lawyers um, it's expensive um, it, there's a kind of stigma to it so um, I mean once they're they're you, you've agreed to represent them, that's less likely to be a problem, particularly if you've developed a good relationship with them. And in discussing uh, a little bit more towards Patness, uh, we have a few questions. Uh, one is, uh, to what degree would you attribute um, error in deciding to settle or litigate towards client and experience versus confusion or inaccuracy around determining you know, the Atnas? Um, basically the the people in the room may not be the biggest experts and so uh how, what role does that play in um or how much of a role would that play in coming you know making a decision that may not be the best one sure well um to some extent it's the client's um errors to a large extent it's you uh, it's your problems your mistakes as lawyers because you know you're the ones who are doing the assessment of what the expected outcome is going to be. And so uh, in the first instance, when you're first meeting with a client, you're getting their side of the story, inevitably an incomplete picture. Uh, as you go on, you conduct investigations, you may do uh, discovery, you get, and you do some legal research to identify what the causes of action are and what you need to prove and what evidence would be relevant on like that. So as you do, um, your, you, you proceed in pretrial, you get a, a better estimate of what is likely to happen. Now, the client's piece of it is that they come in often with exaggerated expectations or aspirations. Um, and particularly if you, you know, and, and this goes back to what we were talking about before in terms of the reassurance you may give them at the outset. And for example, if you're representing a plaintiff, you know, and you have a demand for a large amount, a million dollars, then there's this cognitive error called anchoring. They keep this million dollar figure in their head. And as you proceed through the case and you negotiate, and you even if you tell them, look, I'm just putting this down, this is what we're, we're gonna ask for, but don't think about it. You know, we're, we're gonna, you're not gonna get that much. Um, maybe if we go to trial, you'll get it, but probably we're going to settle. And if we settle, you're going to get much less than that. They're still keeping that number in their mind, or maybe they have a relative or they saw something on TV. Uh, so they, they have these expectations, um, which are often reinforced in this conspiracy of optimism that we talk about where lawyers tend to want to have a bias that's encouraging to the clients. So um, part of it is having candid conversations with them one of the things that you should know and we discuss in the book a bit is about these um, the research that shows that of cases going to trial the vast majority of them one side or the other gets a worse result at trial than uh, the last side's offer so again i'm going to pick on jim so let's just say um, i'm uh, representing the plaintiff he makes an offer of $100,000 and then um, my client uh, rejects that. We go to trial, we get a verdict of $50,000. Well, that's a terrible result for my client and for me. Um, one, it's less than the $100,000 that he offered. And then we have to spend all this additional time and money and all this stress and anxiety uh, of going to trial. So that's a, a real, problem it's a problem for the client because they're disappointed and it's a problem for me as the lawyer because the the client is really upset um, that i advise them to go to trial instead of taking that hundred thousand dollar offer now that may have been very good advice on my part because 
you know, one of the problems is that trial is very uncertain. So maybe, you know, if you tried the same case a hundred times, um, most of the time you get $500,000 and you just happen to have a bad jury um, this particular time. So it isn't necessarily a, what the researchers call a decision error, but it, it's, it's not a good result. So um, you, you it, it's part of it is your relationship with the client and setting realistic expectations with them, which is tricky. Yeah, I think one of the good follow-ups, Sam asked, um, what's the line between worrying a client and preparing a client as far as getting them ready for this process? A really, really good question. And um, I, I'm not sure I have a good general answer other than to say, be paying attention to how the client is doing by the time that you get to that stage. I mean, you, you often, I mean, if you're negotiating early in a case or even before a lawsuit is filed, which actually happens a lot, um, or early in the case, um, these issues may not be as, as present and, and often it's a lot easier to negotiate and you're not necessarily exploring these difficult issues. The where you run into them and where we get to the concern that Monica raised about the trauma is really typically later in the case. And by that point, you hopefully have a pretty good um, understanding of your client and relationship with them and a sense of what is likely to um, be helpful. One of the things that we suggest is asking them if they would like you to be candid with them, which in some ways is a stupid question, but um, is a good question because, um, you know, who's going to say no, lie to me. Um, on the other hand, if you do that, you, you essentially have a contract, you have an agreement with them that you're going to maybe tell them some bad news. There's a, there's a wonderful book by a colleague of ours, Marjorie Aaron, who teaches at the University of uh, Cincinnati, and it's called Client Science. And it's about delivering bad news. And she's, and actually you can download it. Um, it's online um, and you can download it for free. Marjorie is really interested in helping a lot of people. And she's got another book called Risk and Rigor, talking about decision trees. And that's also available for free. And the, the, the challenge of uh, delivering bad news is, in a sense, preparing them for it and saying, look, I may be raising something that's very sensitive and difficult, and then doing it quickly, sort of ripping the Band-Aid off right away instead of inching it off over a long period of time and then being supportive. And I can't remember, she's got eight steps and these are empirically based, but um, a really, really good question and a really important thing. Um, one of the things that's gonna happen in, for any of you who are representing clients, which I suspect most of you will after you graduate, is helping clients with their, um, their disappointed expectations. Because whether it's a dispute or a transaction, they often come in with hopes and aspirations that are just not going to be satisfied. And so in some ways, part of your job is a counselor. You know, they talk about lawyers as counselors at law. And so your job is to help them process. And part of it is setting realistic expectations at the outset. And again, I'm just sort of repeating, but a lot of it is having a feel for, you know, developing a rapport and getting a sense of what they will or will not tolerate. Thank you. And in going back to BATNAs, um, at one point you described BATNAs as shiny, and the, they were asking if you could elaborate a little bit more on what you mean by that. Sure. Uh, I am just thrilled that there are so many questions. Uh, Jim, you obviously are a phenomenal teacher because your students are asking these great questions. Um, the reason I say shiny, and, and this I'm poking my dispute resolution colleagues um, because I think there's a lot of our theory that 
we use because it's been used before and it's simple and students seem to like it. Um, you know, they've got all their PowerPoints already. It's in all the textbooks um, and, and people seem to understand. They think they understand what VATN is. And so it's a shiny object that you can um, attract attention or distract attention um, with. And so, uh, and what I'm saying, and I'm needling my clients, is that they're getting um, distracted by it as well because it's so simple and seemingly appealing. I guess what, what got me and in, in what prompted me to write that um, Batten has got to go um, post was a very good friend of mine who also is recently retired really knowledgeable, experienced guy, and he got it wrong. Um, not to mention the fact that I got it wrong. Um, you know, one of the posts I wrote was, um, you know, do you use BATNA wrong? And then I had to write a second one saying, you know, um, I plead guilty. Um, I was using it wrong. Uh, so it's, it's, it's deceptive. And, and particularly because everybody seems to think they know what it is. And um, I would add to that collection um, these two models of negotiation, which I imagine you may be dealing with with different names, but positional adversarial negotiation I mentioned, or uh, cooperative and uh, interest-based negotiation, a variety of other names. And people think they know what that they are, but um, I wrote a long article based on interviews I did with lawyers about actual cases that that they settled and what the behavior that these lawyers described did not match the theory that we all love so much and that we teach and it's in all the dang textbooks. So um, that's why I refer to it as shiny, it's deceptive. Um, there's this article, this negotiation framework article, which um, I wrote that I think very highly of, and it, it's based on these interviews I did, and it describes cases in detail. One of the things about negotiation that's another deceptive thing uh, is that we tend to focus on the tail, the very last end of a, you know, the tail end of a case. Well, when you're representing a client, you don't represent them only for the very tail end of the case. You represent them from the very beginning, and part of what I did in these interviews was to ask lawyers to talk about the cases starting from the very first contact they have with the lawyers, with the, with the clients. And, um, and what I found was that if you look at negotiation one, that a case is full of lots of little negotiations. So it's really a string of negotiations with clients, with counterpart lawyers, with judges, with supervisors. I mean, there's just a ton of negotiation that goes on in a single case. And that um, these models uh, that I just described fit some cases, but didn't fit a lot of them. And, and what I really like about this article is it describes in concrete detail a bunch of these cases that the lawyers described to me. And so you can get a better feel for kind of the reality of the way lawyers work in pretrial. And, and I, I wrote two articles based on this study. One, this one about the negotiation framework that, that talks about the problems with these two models. And then a related one that's more practical that's talk, that it's called um, good pretrial lawyering, uh, planning to get to yes, uh, sooner, cheaper, and better, something like that. And it reflects the uh, advice of the lawyers who I had identified. And, and I selected lawyers um, as those who were considered to be, have a good reputation, or were good lawyers. And um, I think that you know, they're both very readable and I think you would get a lot out of them. And they're, they're not shiny, but they're really interesting. Um, Darby asks if you can talk about the applicability of the uh, Lira concept uh, to transactional focus negotiations. Excellent question, Darby. Um, this is just a great class. Um, and I think all of your questions are, are really good. So thank you, Darby, for that one and all of you for all the other questions that you've asked. Um, it, it is applicable. The book and most of our work has been focused on the litigation context 
but the three basic elements the, in the, the Lira structure can be adapted for transactions. So the three elements are the expected outcome, the future tangible costs, and the future intangible costs. And so in the, and what you're looking for in a transaction, let's just say you are negotiating some, nego uh, some commercial transaction, you want to first estimate what the likely net benefit is going to be for your client. And that isn't certain. So, I mean, you're looking for a certain degree of profit, but um, there are all sorts of factors that may affect that. You don't know what competitors may come into the market. You don't know what the consumer demand may be. You don't know what the relationship is going to be like with your, your, your uh, contracting partner. There are all sorts of factors that may affect what the net Pro, uh, profit or benefit may be. So that's the first element that corresponds to the, the BATNA in essence. Um, the second one is what the costs of doing the negotiation and consummating the transaction are. So if you think that you're going to get a million dollars of profit over a period of time and it's going to cost you $100,000 to negotiate and, and, um, and consummate the transaction, your net benefit is going to be $900,000. And then you want to think about a whole range of intangible consequences, uh, uh, corollary uh, benefits or, uh, or, or costs. So it may, if you develop uh, this contractual, you know, this transaction, um, it may help your, uh, I mean, a lot of these actually would be benefits um, that, that um, your clients would be concerned about. So it may give you access to relationships. It may give you access to, um, it may help you develop new markets. It may help you um, uh, give you access to certain financing. There may also be some downsides. So for example, if you um, develop a, a deal with one partner, it may cut off the potential for developing deals with other uh, partners. So you want to consider all three of those factors to come up with the bottom line. One thing that's a little different about transactions as composed to, compared to litigation is that there may be multiple um, alternatives. Now, you know, in the litigation context, I said, well, you could unleash a Twitter mob or you could do some self-help. Um, mostly your clients are not going to be thinking about that. There's going to be really one alternative course of action that's a serious one, and that's going to be going, continuing litigation and going to trial. In a transactional context, there may be multiple possible uh, commercial partners, or the status quo may be better than on a net basis than uh, proceeding with the transaction. So you want to evaluate each of the, the plausible alternatives um, to help you develop a, a sense of which one actually is the best course of action, which one is the, the BATNA, and then try and identify what the value is by considering all three of the elements that I've just described. And Noel asks, piggybacking off of that, does, uh, when using the layer process, does the likelihood of a specific outcome affect your calculation? And what happens if the ex expected outcome is truly unknown? Well, it's always unknown. It's, uh, that's the nature of life. Um, and part of the, uh, you know, my poking of my colleagues is, you know, and again, uh, it's me too, is these concepts of WATNA, which is a very popular one, the worst alternative to negotiated agreement, or the MALATNA, uh, which I use, the most likely alternative to negotiated agreement. Those ideas were really relating to the value of the alternative as opposed to the course of action. But the, the impetus for them, to, and, and they, they don't make sense as described in some of my posts, but what they do reflect is the fact that there is uncertainty. So let's just talk in the, the litigation context. So again, if you imagine trying a case a hundred times, the results will look like a normal bell curve probably. So you'll have, you know, most of the time the results will be uh, bunched up in the middle, but there'll be, um, outcomes that will be outliers and some of the bell curves will be very um, narrow and tall, in which case you'll have a lot more confidence in it. 
or some of them may be very wide and, and low, in which case you have much less. And so part of, and the way you, you get this is by trying to identify what the uncertainties are about the law and the facts. And uh, I don't know if you're going to get into decision trees, but that's really the logic of it. What you want to do in decision trees, and again, this is an area that Marjorie Aaron has written about in this risk and rigor book, is to identify all of the these potential uncertainties and then mathematically um, combine them to come up with your best um, estimate. And then part of what you can do is you can vary your estimates. So you can say, well, instead of assuming that you're going to defeat a summary judgment motion, you do have a 70% chance of defeating it. Maybe you're going to have a 60% chance. And instead of having a, a, a verdict of $100,000, maybe you'll have a verdict of $200,000. And so you can combine and play with these alternatives, uh, possible assumptions to come up with a range of possible outcomes. What this indicates is just that great uncertainty. And one reason that so few cases actually are tried is that there is so much uncertainty. Lawyers get scared a lot. I was going to use a expletive, but it's being recorded. They, they, lawyers do not like to lose. They do not like to um, be out of control. And there are just too many things in litigation that are out of control. And so there's a great impetus to settle, to uh, have that control, to, to reduce that risk. And so, um, you know, your job is to do the best estimate you can. Uh, some people really like decision trees. Um, we found that in the research, a lot of lawyers really don't. Uh, some think that they um, are based on dubious assumptions and question the validity of them. Uh, some feel that it's not very helpful in communicating with clients. Um, but, you know, even if you don't use decision trees, which I suspect most lawyers actually probably don't, you do actually what you're trained for in law school, which is you do legal research, you do factual discovery, you consult with uh, colleagues or experts, and you make the best estimate you can and try and prepare your client for the fact that the outcome is really uncertain. Um, one of the things that you know from your law school classes, even if you win at trial, um, you know, that's not the end of the story. You can go up and down on appeal, you know, a long time. And then even if you get a verdict, you know, as a plaintiff, there's no guarantee that you can collect on it. So there's just, and then, you know, you get a verdict and then the defendant goes bankrupt. There are a zillion things that could go wrong, which is one reason why, again, lawyers tend to want to settle and why you are very wise in taking this course on negotiation. I think another question we had is a very practical one. What happens when you do get it wrong? How do you handle the client's disappointment? Uh, well, when I first practiced law, I worked for a number of lawyers, and one of them I didn't think very highly of. Um, and he did what I think a lot of lawyers do, which was he blamed the judge. He said, the judge got it wrong. We had a great case, but the judge got it wrong, the jury got it wrong, you know. Um, part of it is preparing your clients in advance that it's an uncertain prospect and that they're rolling the dice and that they may win and they may lose. And that, um, and part of it is, is this relationship you develop with your clients. Um, you've heard me say it a number of times, and that's because I think it's really important. And if the clients believe that you've done everything that you can and that you've been diligent and you've been careful, then they will, they'll be unhappy, um, but they'll understand mostly, many times. Um, one student asked, how frequently do you find attorneys reassessing their BATNA or their bottom line? They should be doing it all the darn time. 
Um, you know, whenever you get, um, you know, new information. Um, now, part of this may be, I mean, there are a lot of different factors that will affect your expectation about what the court outcome may be. So um, one may be, you know, obviously the, the, the evidence that you can produce in discovery. And so if you find the smoking gun, which is the holy grail of litigators, they just have this fantasy that if they do enough discovery, they will find the smoking gun, that great email where the defendant says, or some employee, some top employee of the defendant, I really wanted to screw grandma. And, um, and you've got this great piece of evidence and that will affect your assessment or you discover some new um, law, some new, uh, some new statute or a new case comes down. Um, there you may assess, um, you know, all sorts of factors that may affect it. Uh, who, if there's a change in the law firm on the other side, um, so all sorts of things. So it, it's something that you should be constantly doing. Um, part of, you know, in terms of negotiation, what you're looking for is the bottom line. And one factor in that is what the other side's assessment of the BATNA, the value of the BATNA is. And so part of, in this kind of hardball negotiation, what the lawyers are trying to do is convince the other side that their case stinks and your case is great and that you're going to win if you go to trial. Um, now that isn't actually affecting, I mean, I suppose you could be discouraging and demoralizing the lawyer on the other side and maybe that would affect the likely outcome. It's more the perception, the expectation about what the outcome would be. That's really what you're playing with in the negotiation you'll never know um, what, you know, and that's one of the, the virtues of settling. And one of the virtues of dealing with the client is if you settle, you can't know what the outcome would be at trial. One of the, the bad things is if you do go to trial, the, the, the decision errors I was telling you about before that the researchers found out about, you know, so there the client knows darn well that they could have gotten $100,000 if they settle, but you know, only got $50,000. If you settle, they'll, they'll never know about that. And that study, by the way, what they found was that something like 60% of cases that went to trial, the plaintiffs got a worse result at trial than uh, the last settlement offer by the defendant. About 20% of the, uh, of the, or 25%, something like that, of the defendants got a worse result uh, at trial than the plaintiff's last demand. So only about 15% of the cases were in the zone where it, it made sense for the parties to go to try the case because neither side was getting an offer as good for them as a result at trial. And, that, and those statistics, this research actually only looked at the actual trial outcome, didn't look at the, uh, at the tangible costs. So um, you know, the, the legal fees of, of going to trial um, weren't considered there. So the actual results are, are much worse. Part of this is that lawyers drink their own Kool-Aid, um, that lawyers believe, you know, that they can win. And, um, and so they, and part of it is the lawyers think they can win. And part of it is the clients for lots of reasons want to really go to trial. And so, um, they, they do. And you, um, um, you sometimes lose, but, um, most of the time, uh, what you're going to want to do is help your client get to a settlement and ideally get to the settlement early. I mean, from my perspective, one of the absolute worst results is the proverbial settlement on the courthouse steps, because, you've invested all this time and money and grief and stress and anxiety. And, you know, you're, you're, you're pumped up and your clients are pumped up. You've got all this adrenaline flowing. And then you go to court and the judge says, you two go out into the hall and settle this case. And you do, no one's really happy. You've invested all this time and money. Often the result for one party, the other is, is, as you know, is worse than what they could have gotten earlier on. So really what 
this Lyra book is about and what my earlier book on lawyer and with planned early negotiation is about is trying to do this kind of assessment early and working with your client early and developing a good relationship with your counterpart lawyer as early as you can so that you make it as easy as possible and that you don't incur unnecessary tangible and intangible costs. And let me give you one piece of advice that may be worth the price of admission to law school entirely. And that is, whether it's a transaction or litigation, try and develop a good relationship with your counterpart lawyer. This is so important. Um, I see some of you nodding your head. Uh, probably you've seen, I'm guessing some of you have worked uh, in law firms, but I can't tell you how many lawyers have said, if you tell, you know, that I've heard them say, if you tell me who the lawyer is on the other side, I'll tell you how this case is gonna turn out. And lawyers have reputations as being reasonable or difficult. And if they're reasonable, then life is easy. If they're difficult, your life is your own private hell. It's just no fun and you're gonna be fighting over every stupid little thing that really doesn't matter. And I've heard stories in, in my first book on learning with planned early negotiation, I include some of them, where lawyers tell stories about successful negotiations with, with their counterpart lawyers who uh, have reputations for being really difficult, but because they develop good relationships with them, they've been able to work with them successfully. So how do you do that? Well, you try and be a normal human being, which, you know, going to law school, we're kind of uh, squeezing that out of you, but hopefully you can retain some of that after you graduate. And so, you know, you just have a conversation with them. I mean, my suggestion is at the outset of a case, you get on the phone and if you don't know them already and introduce yourself and say, hey, we're working on this case together. Um, like to get this thing worked out as reasonably as possible. Obviously, I'm going to be representing my client's interest. You're going to be representing your client's interest, but let's not make this any more difficult than it needs to be. Um, tell me a little bit about yourself. Where did you go to law school? What kind of practice have you had? Uh, who's your favorite sports team? Um, you know, all sorts of things. Tell me where you like to travel, hobbies, and you develop a relationship with people. And when you do that, it's harder for them to be difficult with you. And there's a value, you are adding value to your client when you do that because you're not wasting time on stupid stuff, on wasted effort on things that just really aren't important. And I hate to say that a lot of what litigation is about is wasted effort. And part of what got me interested in mediation in the first instance and negotiation and particularly early negotiation was avoiding that waste, avoiding the, the tangible waste of the financial costs as well as the intangible costs, which, I mean, you read the stories um, that, and the, the accounts that really my co-authors, Michaela and Heather um, developed and, and people are talking about the trauma. I mean, it is, I mean, you, you read that blog post I mean, that is, is no fun. The other thing is not only is it no fun for the clients, but I hate to tell you, lawyers don't like it either. It is really stressful um, to go to trial. There's just, I mean, those days are long. It, it messes up your, your, your schedule. Um, cases settle and all of a sudden you've got a big hole in your calendar. It's just settling and settling early if it's appropriate, if your client, if it, you satisfy your client's interests is a, a really, really good result for many, many reasons. And I realize I've been rambling on and I can't remember what started that, but um, I guess it was the advice about developing good relationships with your counterpart lawyers. And if you, if you try and do that and they say, you know, go F you, well, that's really important information to have. You know, that you're in for a fight and that you can't necessarily trust and you may want to try again. You may want to try the, uh, the gambit of we can do this the easy way or the hard way. You know, my client and I would prefer the easy way, but if you want to do it the hard way, we can do that too. So um, trying to develop a good relationship with the counterpart lawyer is a really, really important thing to do 
for, for many reasons. There are so many things that you're going to do. You're going to want, I mean, and I use the term counterpart lawyer, not opposing counsel, because even when you're having really hard battles with your, your counterpart lawyer, you're still going to be cooperating on all sorts of things. You're going to be cooperating on discovery. You're going to have discovery plans, all sorts of things that you have to do together. And it's just, and your life is too short. You know, you're young, uh, most of you, I assume. Um, and so, you know, we haven't kicked the, you know, the, the spirit out of you yet. But if you talk to a lot of older lawyers, a lot of them are going to say, you know, I don't need this crap. Um, I've, let's just do what needs to be done and not waste time and energy on stupid stuff. So anyway, let me stop there and see what else you got. Well, I think the last question I'll ask since you're uh, giving out advice is from Mercedes. She says she's interested in going to ADR at an early stage in her career within the first five years, hopefully. Um, what advice would you give to someone who wants to make that transition early on? Good luck, uh, Megan. Um, it's hard. People aspire to that. Um, even people who um, have a lot of experience have a hard time. I was talking with a guy who practiced law for a while. He directed a court mediation program. He's been on his own as a private mediator. Um, he and you know he was telling me about the struggles of being in practice one of the things is that um, being in practice either as a neutral or as an advocate it's a business and um, you need to be doing some client development um, and um, part of it is developing a reputation for reasonableness if for example if you want to well if you want to be a mediator or an arbitrator um, often what happens is that you know, what you really need to do, I mean, let's just talk about it, and in in, it's typically in the litigation context, theoretically, one could be a mediator for deals. People talk about that, but I don't think that happens very much. But if you, you want to uh, uh, become a, a mediator, as a practical matter, you're going to have to do litigation for a while, because for better or worse, a lot of lawyers who are the ones who are going to be hiring you are going to want your opinion about the case. And in order for you to give an intelligent opinion, you're going to need to have had experience or they're gonna to need to think that you've had experience. So part of it is that you're gonna to need to have litigation experience, ideally been an advocate in mediation and developing a reputation for being reasonable. A lot of mediators um, get referrals from lawyers who had been their counterpart lawyers who said, you know, you were on the opposite side of a case for me, but I thought you, you were a very reasonable person. You, you demonstrated good judgment. And so I'd like to have you help me and my client work out this problem. Um, the other thing I would say, one of the interesting roles that I've studied a bit is as inside counsel in businesses. Um, you function, those inside counsel function sort of as mediators between the client, the business executives and the outside counsel. And often they do a form of mediation. Now those are difficult positions to get as well. And typically they're gonna want to have people who have, uh, uh, who have uh, experience in litigation. Um, so the, the short answer is, um, you know, pay attention, go to conferences, develop relationships, which you should do in any case, network, um, and get experience litigation and as an advocate in mediation and um, be a good, reasonable person. I mean, I think a lot of times when people get hired, it's because they're nice people. Thank you very much, John. Uh, Jim, did you have any uh, last comments before we let John? I want to make sure we're honoring your time here. I appreciate that. You're muted, Jim. I don't have any additional comments. Um, John, thank you so much for, for your time and your expertise and, and agreeing to come and talk to the class. It was really, really enlightening and uh, we're really grateful to have you. Well, um, it was my pleasure. Uh, as you know, Jim, I have 
put out the word that I'm happy to do this. One of the virtues of, uh, you know, I don't know, virtues is the right word, but with this horrible pandemic situation is that people are used to doing things by video now. And so I've been doing talks like this. And uh, as you can tell, I, I enjoy it. And uh, um, as I say, I, this is like teaching without grading. So it's the, the fun part. Jim has to read all your papers and grade, but uh, you know, that's what he get paid the big bucks for. Uh, I realize that it's getting dark here. Um, and so you're barely getting to see my face, but that may be just as well. So um, with that, I wish you all uh, good luck. I hope that at least some of what I've said made sense and you find helpful and I uh, wish you have good careers. Thank you, John. All right, bye-bye.